So it's, it's clear that I'm the one that knows the least about biomedicine of anybody on this panel and probably anybody in, in the whole room. Uh, but I can try to tell you a little bit about what it's like to live in a sea of data and swim in it every day and how to get along with that. And then hopefully it'll apply to the type of work that you guys do. So here's my caricature of how traditional science works. Uh, you start with a theory, you collect the data, it's my data, I collected it, I compare the data to the theory, if it works, I publish, if not, I go back to the lab. And now it seems like we're transitioning to this new approach where it's not always my data, maybe it's some shared data, maybe I'm gathering data from multiple sources and putting it together and analyzing it and visualizing it and computing it, and I still have the publisher repeat, uh, but it's our relationship with the data is different. And uh, we've talked a lot about the types of tools and methods and algorithms you need. I think there's also a cultural component that we need to uh, uh, deal with. And so there's this social challenge of what does it mean to share data? I've, I heard uh, talking over lunch, someone saying, oh, I really want to get this data from these people in this other lab, but they don't want to share it with me. Uh, how, how are publications going to work? Funding and tenure, all these things that matter uh, we've gone by number of citations as being the primary uh, uh, measure. Maybe we should look at uh, can you get credit for creating data or sharing data or analyzing data in a new way and republishing it? Can we change the culture to accept those types of things? Uh, there's another challenge for computing. If you need a lot of computing power, should you rent or buy it? It seems like uh, the field as a whole is, is moving more towards renting. You don't need to have your own uh, data centers. Uh, if you're going to do that, should you single source from the best vendor or should you be flexible enough to uh, go back and forth among multiple ones? Uh, if you have a lot of data in your lab, how are you going to get it to this computing source if you're generating uh, terabytes or more per day? Uh, who's going to archive your data uh, as it gets uh, older and you have enough to store a few days worth but you don't have enough to store years worth? And what are the right computational models? We've heard a lot about that today. Here's just one example of this uh, GPCR simulation uh, uh, run here at Stanford, uh, 600 teraflops per second, and Google is donating 3 million CPU hours per day uh, to this type of uh, e-science, and uh, so there's more you can apply for if you wanted to donate it, or you can also buy it from uh, multiple vendors. Uh, I think another thing uh, that doesn't get talked about enough, like sure, we talk about the algorithms, but before you get to the fancy algorithms, there's just these kind of uh, uh, best practices in, in software engineering that are harder to pick up. We talked, uh, we heard about these uh, pie-shaped researchers that have to know about your scientific discipline and also have to know about the computing discipline. And some of it is just this core engineering, not so much the fancy algorithms. So the fact that you should have tests, don't just run it till it works, have tests that prove it works, and when you make a change, the tests still work. <clears throat> that you worry about privacy and security, and you have a methodology to deal with that. That you have uh, version control and provenance of your data. Uh, you know, so I've been out to a lot of labs talking to scientists, and they'll show me a beautiful plot of their data and, and how it's state of the art. And I say, well, where did, the, where did this plot come from? And they say, oh, well, you can tell from the file name because the file name says data A slash method B applied to method C uh, dot JPEG. Uh, and probably there are better ways of handling your data and your provenance than that. Uh, but it's tough to change the culture to get everybody to accept that. Uh, how do you design your code? How do you change the code over time? Uh, <clears throat> I hear so often about, oh, we were doing great until our postdoc left, and now nobody understands how the code works anymore, and we have to start over from scratch, right? We, we should be more robust than that. We shouldn't have uh, uh, the disappearance of one person means that the whole project goes down. Uh, you know, it used to be you had a paper notebook in which you uh, logged everything that went on in the lab. Uh, that, that won't do anymore, but we need new types of logs and, and notebooks that will keep up with this. And we need a review process for, say, when are you ready? When do you have something that you're ready to ship? At Google, you know, we're very concerned about that. We don't show anything out to the customers until we know it's good and ready to go. Labs need that as well. 
And you know, so in general, it's, it's, uh, software engineering is like flossing, right? Everybody knows it's good for you and you should do it, uh, but we don't always remember to. So uh, uh, like your dentist, I'm gonna try to remind you one more time to uh, go out there and do that. Uh, then uh, another factor that a few people have touched on is this issue of data mining, where you know, in traditional science, you've got a hypothesis and it's kind of 50-50 whether it's true, and you do your experiment, and if you get a p-value of 0.05, then you know there's a 5% chance that you have an error. But in this new paradigm, if you're you know, running some uh, uh, RNA chip array, and you have a thousand possibilities of which you expect one of them to only be true, now if you have a p of 05, you have a 98% chance of making an error. And if you're running uh, a million of these uh, essays, uh, even if you get the P down to uh, one in 10,000, you still have a 91% chance of error. So it's no longer run, get a result, and publish. It's run, get a result that's interesting, but it's still probably wrong. And uh, John Iannandes and, and among others have uh, talked about that. And so that's just step one, right? You have to remember uh, this is suggestive, now let's go back, let's attack it some other way, and if it survives the second and third statistical test, then probably you've got something. There's a challenge of uh, chaos, so the world is non-stationary, things change over time. There are these uh, very unusual events that um, you haven't seen, even if you have uh, terabytes of data, it hasn't occurred before. Uh, there's this fact that uh, data collection changes the world. Right, so if you go in your lab and you're doing a small experiment, the world doesn't notice. But if you're uh, doing a huge experiment and gathering from everywhere, then the world does notice. And your fact of uh, gathering that data does affect what's going on. You have to uh, be able to deal with that. Uh, the models are complex, hard to understand, easy to make mistakes. And so we just need more experience in this whole methodology as it becomes more complex. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, a, a non-biomedicine task, uh, one that uh, I deal with, which is recognizing objects and pictures. Uh, here's a, a sample uh, test data set called ImageNet that we run every year. And the idea is we show you a picture and you say, what's in this picture? You have a computer algorithm to say that. But it's not just easy things like, is this a cat or, it's a, or is this a dog? There are uh, 300 types of fungus within this data set, and you have to identify those. So, so I wouldn't score very well, because I don't know 300 types of fungus. Uh, so it's a difficult task. Here's some of the things that, it gets, uh, that are easy for a machine to classify and hard. Uh, you know, some more abstract things like uh, bottle, which can be of many shapes, like the funny red ones we got today, are harder than uh, things that are always the same, like uh, Blenheim Spaniel. I probably couldn't do that but the computers are really good at it. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an analogy. How do we solve this problem? Uh, so imagine you're the manufacturer of uh, kitchen tiles and you have a catalog that has uh, arrays of tiles like this and you're trying to sell them. And then somebody says, well, we should get into the modern age. We should have something where you can add an image, click a button, upload it, and we'll ship you out tiles of exactly that image. Turns out that's too expensive because you're making a custom tile for every uh, little uh, spot of the image. So instead you say, well, what if we just had an inventory of tiles? You upload a picture, we go into inventory, find the tiles we've already made, put them together. They don't have to be an exact representation of the picture, but they should be pretty close. So that turns out to be cheaper. And now the question is, what tiles should you have in inventory? And when you get a picture, how should you represent them? And so by analogy, this is saying our inventory kind of represents what's actually in the pictures. If you can pick a good inventory, then you have a representation of what's out there in the world. So you collect all these pictures that are out there in the world, and you say, what are these made of? If you've done that, you've kind of represented what the world is like. Uh, and here's a little bit of math. So for each piece of the image, you're trying to come up with a copy that's most like the image. Uh, what counts as being uh, like the image, that's where sort of some of the science goes in. So most of what I'm saying is just math. It's just trying to minimize its difference. But the science goes into what counts as being similar. And there we have to actually know how does retina work, how does the V1 area of the cortex work, what uh, frequencies of uh, images are important that we recognize as being different, which ones do we not recognize uh, in terms of lighting and shading and color balance, white balance and so on, what's important and what's not important. For that, we have to know how the eye works. For everything else, is just math. Uh, 
And here's the result. So when this was first run in 1996 by uh, Olshuizen at, at Berkeley, he said, what are the most important pictures, uh, what are the most important pieces that pictures are made out of? And it turned out the answer was, pictures are made out of lines. Uh, now, of course, any kindergartner already knew that, so it wasn't that exciting, and this work kind of uh, didn't go too far for a, a few years. Uh, then, a little bit later, uh, Jeff Hinton and some others came up with the idea of saying, well, instead of just having one inventory of pieces, which we know are just going to be lines, what if we had multiple levels of inventory? So we have lines, and then if we put all the lines together and made bigger pieces, and put those bigger pieces together and made even more pieces, then what would happen? And for the first time around 2006, something interesting came out, which is this. So you do that in inventory one, you get lines, but in inventory two, you get, if you showed it pictures of faces, you get eyes and noses and mouths. So it's figured out that these are important components of the world, and then at the next level, it figures out that faces are a component of the world. And similarly, it can figure out that uh, wheels and doors are, uh, are parts, and then cars are parts. So it's actually, without telling it anything about the world, all I told it was sort of how the eye works. I didn't say, look out for these types of objects. It's able to pick them out and put them into a hierarchy correctly. So this is very exciting, and a lot of the work in the last few years have gone through that. So we did an experiment where we put up 10 million YouTube videos, uh, and this is what came out, among other things. Uh, you, YouTube goes in, cats come out, so we figured out that uh, these are the best response for uh, one of the pieces is a cat piece, another one is a, a face piece. Uh, so we decided that those are important parts of the world. Uh, here's uh, in more detail what the network looks like. So it's this multi-layer network. In the uh, 2012 ImageNet uh, competition, this got a 16% error rate. And then the more complicated one with three times as many layers in 2014 is down to a 6% error rate. Uh, so pretty rapid progress and sort of the whole field has shifted to this type of approach. Uh, in the remaining few seconds, let's talk about another sample task, which is writing captions for pictures. So we train this by giving it uh, pairs of pictures and their captions. And now we test it by giving it a new picture and say, what's the caption for, for this? So it has to not only understand the world, what's in this picture, it has to also understand what's worth talking about and understand the structure of English sentences to come up with a nice grammatical sentence. All these combined into one. And here's an example. So a human labeled this, a young girl sleep on the sofa cuddling a stuffed bear. And uh, one of our uh, models uh, programs came up with a close-up of a child holding a stuffed animal. And the second version of the system came up with a baby is asleep next to a teddy bear. So pretty amazing that we can do all this, that uh, just by showing it examples, not by telling it anything about how the world works, it's covered enough of the world that it understands what's in these pictures and it understands how to talk about it. Of course, it's not always perfect. And I'll show you some of the outtakes for when it didn't quite get everything right. A couple of giraffes standing next to each other. So despite the millions of training examples, uh, it had never seen a donkey wearing purple pajamas before <laughs> and got thrown for a loop. Here's another one, reflection of a dog in a side view mirror. Objects in mirror may be larger than they appear. And finally, a man riding a skateboard. <laughs> And I don't know if you can see that, but there are actually these uh, horizontal lines on the bottom that maybe look a little bit like the body of a skateboard. Of course, there's no wheels on the skateboard, but our system just couldn't imagine that anybody like Elvis would do that unless they were on a skateboard. Uh, so we're not perfect yet, but amazing and promising results. And kind of this combination of saying we have sophisticated mathematics, we have a view of the world uh, which is just collecting a lot of data, and then we have very small bits that say we're going to describe what we know about the world, what we know about the visual system, and so on. And combining those together, we get very interesting results. Thank you.